the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, let me say what a delight to be with you all this morning in uh, this lovely place. Um, although I've gotten to see uh, Father Gene and Father Bob and Father Sean and uh, uh, Deacon Kevin fairly recently at our synod meeting uh, in, in April, uh, we haven't been back to an haven't had an opportunity to be back with the whole congregation for almost a year or to be in this place. And so, um, although I'm able to keep up with the clergy, and they are something to keep up with in this place, delightful group, uh, it is very exciting to be in this new place with you. I remember last year, as I remember last year, we were in a big kind of auditorium space in, um, in a whole different building. And, uh, and that was very lovely and very nice, but I must say, this is almost like they built it for you. A um, uh, great place. It was uh, lovely in the library this morning for the 8 o'clock service. And uh, this setting is uh, terrific. And I just see it as a, God's, a God thing, a providential uh, arrangement for you to be here. And uh, Jean tells me that they treat you very well and are very happy to have you here and, and uh, take good, good care of the... Um, setting up and taking down and cleaning up and all that. If there's a problem with these arrangements, and we have lots of them in the diocese now in which we um, maybe have services in a different church or we rent space in a um, public building or someplace else, it's that after a time, it can become burdensome about taking everything down and it disappears every week, have to putting it all back up, making all the arrangements. So when you have something that works this well, um, it just we certainly thank God for uh, what he's provided uh, for you. And this is even a, a, the look of it is a lovely uh, space. Anyway, we are delighted to be here. And I uh, noticed that it looks like it's picnic time again. Yes, sir. I don't know why I'm so lucky to make picnic time every, <laughs> every, um, every year. I, it feels really good. And, of course, confirmation. Um, my wife, Gretzi, and I, uh, have uh, been very well taken care of long before we arrived last we arrived here last night we were uh, over at the uh, uh, at the hotel right close by so we can come zipping into the eight o'clock service and um, there is somebody among you who takes very good care to see to it that we have a bottle of wine a bit of chocolate and a new book every time we come and uh, I thank her and the con Congregation. Well, actually, the book is personally picked out by uh, Jean, uh, a Tim Keller book that I had not had yet. And so Pastor Tim Keller from Presbyterian Church in, uh, in New York, where your daughter is attending, right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, she probably appreciates a good sermon now and then. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgive me. Forgive me. Um, I'd like to go to Tim Keller's church on uh, Sunday. Be right. Such a great guy. We had him at the Anglican 1000, the Anglican 1000 church planning conference, I think two years ago. And uh, he was spectacular, speaks as well as, well as he writes, and, and uh, just really good stuff. Anyway, thank you so much for taking such good care of us. And uh, Gretzi, where, where are you? Over here? Stand up. So this is my wife, uh, Gretzi, over here. So, um, well, now... Uh, this morning is, uh, of course, uh, not only, uh, at least at this service, the time for uh, confirming, receiving, and commissioning new folks in this particular uh, body uh, and asking the Holy Spirit to come on them. So let me say that little piece first. When we do get past um, the sermon... I know that's how some people feel, get past the sermon. We get past the sermon, little teaching, we'll come and uh, lay hands on uh, this group of folks that have been prepared carefully and, uh, and the Lord has been preparing and you have as, as a body. And we will ask the Holy Spirit to come and touch their lives and change them and fill them and anoint them for new things. This is not a rote um, just a liturgical act. It has 
uh, we do it using the liturgy, and it has a form to it, but we're really talking about live Holy Spirit interaction with this particular group of people. Now, we're asking the Holy Spirit to interact with us as a whole this morning for the whole body and, the, and all of us to be filled and, and uh, freed and, uh, and healed in whatever way we need uh, a touch of the Holy Spirit. Some of us need a, a word, need to hear something from the Lord this morning. Some of us need to get free of something. Some of us need to be healed of something. Some of us have, need to see something fresh. Uh, but in this case, this group of people, we're asking the Holy Spirit to come and in one sense commission them, or in a real sense, commission them for work in the body of Christ and to give them gifts, new gifts of the Holy Spirit that actually would actualize that commissioning. Things that would make it possible for you to hear the Lord differently, see the Lord's hand moving differently, to, um, to know how to, m to move and be the Lord's person in different situations. Holy Spirit stuff, where you'll maybe on your bed at night get dreams that are different. Uh, read the Word of God differently, uh, more deeply, more, more fully. Uh, and if you pray with somebody or lay our hands, that things would happen. That's what we want to have happen. We want to see gifts, like from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, in a church, come into being in your lives. And, and of course, wisdom, knowledge, and all of that. So, but let's come back for a moment, because it certainly comes together, in the scriptures we read this morning. Uh, there is, a, of course, there is a very bright light right there. Really bright. I'm just going to move over here. Do you always preach in that light? I do. Yeah. Well, you have new, younger eyes. Um, and it's quite bright over here, too. Um, I could come down here, which maybe is, oh, that's much better. Well, what a handsome group when you get out of the light. Down yeah. So these two stories, uh, the one from 1 Kings and then the reading from uh, the, uh, uh, the New Testament, the, the Gospel Scripture, are obviously linked. Uh, the intention is to give us some background uh, in, from the uh, lesson in 1 Kings about how God has moved and takes care of us and what's been his heart through all the scriptures. So it gives us a sort of paradigm to look at what Jesus did to the, uh, uh, um, the, 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 the dead boy in uh, the New Testament scriptures. Um, the, the Lord's heart is dis on, the Lord's heart for his people is on display in 1 Kings through that story of the widow and name in a very clear way. Um, the, the, the lady is the widow, the, the, the widow and the, and the mother of the child is in a very desperate situation. There isn't any food for her or her child. She's made peace apparently with her God and she believes both of them are going to die. And uh, no provision seems to be coming. And she runs across, if you will. Now, nobody in God's provision, nobody just runs across anything. It's, uh, you know, God has his hand on all of this stuff. So in comes the prophet, or sh up shows up the prophet, and they have this uh, exchange in which he asks her for some food. Uh, take a little bit of the wheat and the oil and make me a cake. Well, hello, Mrs. Andrew. How nice to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> I've known this lady a very long time. I, don't worry. I haven't known you long enough to kiss you. No, no worry. So the, 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 um, I know Arthur, too, and I am thinking about kissing him before the service is over. So. <laughs> we were together in the great battle when, uh, well, we don't need to go back to old battles, do we? We're in a new day. So uh, the, the prophet in God's economy, the prophet sort of tests her or gives her an opportunity to do something that would be totally out of character. I mean, if you're dying and you're starving, you certainly want to take care of your, your child and even yourself. And so for him to ask her to fix him some food also and bring it to him is, is she, well, she just says, you know, um, I only have this little bit, it's gonna run out, we're dying, but I, I can't do that. He says, no, no, go home, go home, and it won't run out. Make me a cake and bring it, and then we'll see what happens. That's basically what he says. Listen, trust me, go home, take the, the wheat and the oil, make a cake, and little, and then and bring me the first one. Isn't that interesting? Bring, bring me the first one, and then you watch what happens. Now, 
You know, here is where the God thing about being always listening to the Lord. Obviously, even though this lady is, thinks that she's going to die and her son's going to die and it's all over, she has a spirit about her and, and she hears the Lord in what he asks. And what does she do? She goes home and bakes the cake and brings it to him. In other words, something inside her says, is, is in touch with a God thing. She's having, she's having a God moment. This is what when we pray for in baptism, confirmation, or any time when we pray for people, one of, the, one of the main things we're doing is praying that our spirits are more alive. Our spirits are more attuned to the Holy Spirit. That somehow we're able to hear with eyes, hear with ears that hear the Lord, and see with eyes that are touched by the Holy Spirit. So that we can make those responses. In the natural, that lady wouldn't have responded that way. But in something in the Holy Spirit got her to make the cake. She brings it back, feeds him, even while her family's dying. And what happens? Does, 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 is that all? Does the food all go away? No! She honored God. She honored God. She took a risk that she'd heard the Lord. She went back. She feeds the man of God. I love that phrase. Feeds the man of God. And the... Uh, loose, looses the provision then that God had for her because she was, she was faithful in that. Now that's principle number one. If we didn't hear anything else out of the scriptures this morning, if we heard that, take, get, get your spirit tuned. Ask the Lord to help you tune your spirit. And get every chance to pray that your spirit is able to hear the Lord more clearly. Eyes seeing the things God's doing. Ears that, that, that pick up uh, the tune to the, the, to the, to the Lord's uh, voice, uh, awareness in your spirit that something's happening, that would be good. Because then, when you respond to the Lord in the way that uh, comes to you, you will lose his provision for you. You will lose his presence in your life in greater measure. Lose his provision. Things will happen differently. You know, when you are God's person and doing God's things, God's active in your life. It's not that he doesn't love you before or that he loves you more because you, it's that you've loosed his action. I mean, I don't know the mystery of that. It's, as I say, you're just as loved. He absolutely loves you. He died for you if you never heard him once. He's gone to the cross for you if you never heard him once did anything. But, well, you'd have to hear him once to say, yes, I love you, or I want to be yours, or surrender. But uh, you know what I mean. You don't, you don't have to. He's not into performance. So he loves you. But on the other hand, if you want his hand to be active in your life, if you want to see him doing things, if you want to experience his intervention, his leading, his provision, then you have to take some risks. And you have to get, you have to get tuned. And you, have, and, and you want to get more tuned. And sure we miss it sometimes. We're fallible. He's infallible. We're fallible. Okay, so it isn't a perfect deal. You can miss it be wrong. But, but here's the other thing. Even when we're wrong, if we're trying to do it God's way, he covers the mistake many, in, in many ways. That is, he, he, he protects us from our own decisions, our mistakes. He covers us. It isn't like he removes all responsibility or when nothing, there's no bad things ever come from our decisions. I don't mean that. We're not hermetically sealed from, from evil and stuff around us. But he covers our mistakes, and he leads in ways that brings his provision. And so that would be the main piece out of, I think, I think for this morning, the main piece for the story from the Old Testament. Provision. Uh, God's provision. How much God wants to give it. And how, when you trust him and, and, and risk, uh, risk is another way to spell faith. Do you know that? Risk is another well, way to spell faith. It's, it's, it, it loses things uh, from God. Now, it's also the case that God has always been active in our lives and has always been the author of life and death and always able to change things. And so we also get that picture when, when later on he lays down, uh, this is in the, didn't get read in this particular piece, he lays down on the uh, son and, and brings him back to life, or God brings him back to life. Son. Okay, then we come to the New Testament piece. And, um, well, actually the other piece didn't get rid of it. Okay, anyway. Um, now, in the New Testament, 
Jesus is, uh, okay, let me say one other thing here. Now we're, we're in the season of Pentecost. I'll lead into this a little differently. We're in the season of Pentecost. We just got inside the season of Pentecost. Celebrated the birthday of the church and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and uh, so again, we recognize we're in the period of time when we uh, particularly hold up uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the birthday of the church, the recognition that all people who love the Lord and, and have given their lives to Him and their region are, are spirit people. We've been filled with the Spirit. Now, there is also in the New Testament the clear understanding that we can ask for more of the Spirit. We can ask to be filled again and again, and that in some ways, uh, uh, when we aren't aware of, of the Holy Spirit and His gifts and so on, that we can be fully alive and be fully God's uh, born again, but that, that there's more. There's, there's the fullness of the Spirit uh, uh, on us. And, and so the, this coming of the Holy Spirit for the church is not only confirms your baptism, that the, the, your, your Christian persons, um, uh, as it did for those in the upper room, but it filled them with the Holy Spirit and with God's power so they could go about doing God's work. They had loved the Lord, they had been the Lord's, but now they are on fire and, and the Holy Spirit resides in them, not just comes on them for a job like in the Old Testament, but resides in them. He abides in them and they abide in Him. It's, so that's you guys. You are Holy Spirit filled people, Holy Spirit filled people. And if anything, the church in the, in the West needs the example of our brothers and sisters in Africa or the global South, where we live daily with the Holy Spirit as an active force in our lives. That's one of the big differences. In, in much of the rest of the world, not continental Europe, England, or our U.S. Canada, but in all the rest of our Anglican world today, most of the church is alive to the Holy Spirit in ways that are much closer to the New Testament model, the worldview of the New Testament uh, people and the, and the way in which they experienced God and the Holy Spirit. And they live regularly with an expectation that God's going to speak to them, dreams, word uh, in, in the scriptures, uh, something through the pastor. Uh, that, that, that a revelation will come, that somebody's going to get healed when they lay hands on them, that people will be set free from generational bondages and demonic forces, uh, that God will provide when there isn't a uh, um, meal, whatever. Those kinds of things are, those are the, the, the areas where much of the rest of the church uh, is, is more alive to God in that way. In the West, we've gotten a little complacent no, we don't, we, don't, uh, we don't think we need the Lord in the same way. Now, you wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. But the church acts like, well, you know, I mean, we're all uh, able to uh, be well-educated, uh, well well-fed, uh, take care of our own things, and, and, uh, and do it ourselves. That's the Christian motto in the West. Do it yourself. And so the Holy Spirit has a tough time getting in. He says, you know, I would really like to do something for you, but you are so freaking busy all the time doing your own thing that I can't get a, a, a way in. So in, in the West, much of the time, our complacency or our um, being, t being well taken care of, relatively speaking, now I know not everybody is well taken care of by our uh, I mean, our country is not in a great shape in other ways, so I'm not pretending we don't have uh, problems and, and poverty and issues and so on. But by comparison to the rest of the world, by comparison to the rest of the world, we are um, uh, well taken care of. And that, and that tends, along with our knowledge world and our ability to control things to, to make us complacent, to keep us in charge of our own lives, and to make God sort of the backup mechanism. You know, God is the default setting on our lives. When we can't do it ourselves, we're willing to think about it, think about prayer when we can't do it ourselves, or when we don't get something, then, then by default we'll, we'll go to uh, a God. But in the, we, in, the, in the rest of the world, the first thing you go to about anything is who? 
God, yeah. The first person you consult, the first place you go is into God's presence and to ask him about something or to pray or expect it. So, um, I mean, they're just much more active interaction with God in much of the rest of the Anglican world or Christian world, which allows God to be, to bless and to speak and to heal and set free and all of those things. So I, so in this setting, I mean in the second part, I want to say we, we, we in the West need to confront the sin of complacency and the sin of being uh, in charge and in control. And I, and I know that doesn't sound American, does it? I mean, it's almost traitorous to, to talk that way. But in the New Testament, <laughs> allowing God to be in control, to put him first, to depend, be dependent, that's another un-American thing. Nobody should be. We all should be what? Yes. Right. Don't say it. See, that was, you said that much stronger than I would have expected. <laughs> That's right. The American goal is to be independent. The American goal is to be in control. The American goal to be in charge. Right, do it yourself. These are all anti-gospel values, friends. In the new, I don't mean anti-American. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not a commie. I am happy to be here, okay? I'm not preaching socialism or communism or uh, some kind of oddball political thing. I'm saying that the New Testament church was interdependent. The New Testament church was a community. Community first, relationship first, inter interdependence. And they loved one another. They took care of one another. They consult... Who said that? Who said that? Okay, they consulted one another, um, and, they, and they consulted the Lord together. So, uh, so the community grew. The community grew. The relationships grew. The love grew. Uh, the the ex expectation of God was going to come on us all, and, and we were concerned about everybody's good. Okay, so having, okay, so I said those nasty things, but I want to tell you, I really appreciate the way in which the growth of the Holy, the growth of the Holy Spirit in, or the coming of the Holy Spirit on our lives together in this community, in the diocese, in the new church, is, is much more like the New Testament church, much more like the global south, the parts of our room. And I mean, we're not there. We're still Americans, and we still have all of these tendencies to move in these complacency uh, second club. But, but there, is a, there is a thing coming. I mean, I appreciate, for example, that you're sending Sean down to take care of uh, the church, uh, uh, St. George's in Medina. Father Sean's been down to preach a couple times at St. George's in Medina so that uh, Father Ryan wouldn't uh, have to do that on, or wouldn't have to be as involved, take care of it, during the time of his new birth. Actually, it was his wife who had the birth. To, it's their second child, but they had uh, their uh, second child, a new birth in the last two, three weeks, I believe. And here's the deal. I'm going to go one step further. Father Ryan, Cossack, wonderful young man, uh, is a tent maker. He's planting a church in Medina. Uh, it's only about two years old, uh, if that. And uh, they're in a little uh, storefront church about a block off the square. Great. They've been working hard at it, done a great job on it. It's in the part of an old Methodist church. The Methodists have uh, let go of their uh, old downtown church and moved to the suburbs. Whatever the suburb of Medina is, I'm not sure what that means. But anyway, <laughs> they moved out. And um, and left this huge, huge facility. And they're in a piece of it, and it's worked out perfect. They haven't been able to sell it. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, we've been helping it from St. Luke's and from the cathedral as well, and Gene sent Sean down, and it's really great. Well, I started to say, so, to, but see, we're in this era of church planning, too. One more little piece, church planning, a different world. Uh, this wasn't uh, the way it was in the Episcopal church that I uh, grew up in or was a priest most of my life. Uh, I think almost all the priests uh, were full time, and uh, I mean, uh, wives maybe uh, worked or spouses, but uh, but Ryan is an anesthesiologist at an an anesthetist, an anesthetist, whatever. Anesthesia. Do you know that word? Yeah, I want you to say it. All right, that's it. Thank you. I was just testing. Uh, uh, up at the clinic, 
So he works a full-time job at the clinic and then does the church on the weekend. So, and we have a lot of folks who are now in that position. As we go forward and, and we are, uh, plant more churches and do more, we'll see more people doing tent-making ministry and things like uh, this arrangement. Uh, anyway, it really is a great help to him, and that's one of the kind of community things. That wouldn't have happened in the old days either. Really good stuff. The last piece. So, in this setting, Jesus is coming along the road, and he sees the uh, passage of this, uh, or the coming of this um, funeral procession with the dead, with the dead boy and the mother. And of course, the mother is very upset, obviously crying, whole family and so on. And immediately, immediately, it gets Jesus's attention. Uh, so the piece, complacency piece, last second, well, last piece too. He is immediately drawn to that situation. I want you to have an understanding of Jesus enlightened and enlarged this morning that if, if there's trouble, if there's a problem, you don't have to talk Jesus into feeling something about it. You don't have to draw him in, sell him that you need help, or that there ought to be an intervention of some kind from the Holy Spirit. You don't have to, to work at getting his attention. He's already there, and, he, and his response to pain, need, betrayal, hurt, loss, so on. It's, it's just instinctive. I mean, it's him in his DNA. He loves you. He would, and so he looks at this and something instantly clicks with him. And he doesn't ask a lot of questions or, or, or talk to the lady. He just walks up to the funeral procession, touches the briar, and speaks to the child about rising to new life. And the child returns to life. I mean, it's that simple. It doesn't require a lot of liturgy. It doesn't require a lot of talk. You don't have to move it. He just stopped. The same guy who spoke and, the cre and creation came into being. Same way he spoke the word and the cosmos appeared and material. Spoke the word and life returns to this. It tells you who Jesus is. Tells you how he relates to you. And, and the child comes back. Now that child isn't resurrected, it's resuscitated. So the child's going to have to go home to the Lord like everybody else sooner or later. So did Lazarus. So on. There is a difference between resuscitation and resurrection. He brings them back to life, but this isn't the time for the general resurrection yet. So it's going to die. He's going to go home to the Lord later sometime, but then he'll participate in resurrection. Okay, so I just say this this is another, expect, another way in which we can have high expectations for God. We can have high expectations for God. We can become dependent on God, and it would be a good idea. It would be a good idea if we become, uh, I'm telling you, be dependent. Oh, he told us to be dependent. Yes, yes, I said be dependent on God. Become more dependent on God. Look for God to, expect God to do more in your life, and then move on that. Act like that. Let risk doing things that are different, that are uncomfortable, that are out of the box. Be an expectant Christian. Be a dependent Christian. Be a risk-taking Christian. And watch what happens. It, 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 it's that easy to get his attention about these things as it was on that day. And it's the power that resides you. We say that we're in ordinary time in the church during this uh, season. That uh, from Pentecost on, it's ordinary time. Or Pentecost is ordinary time. Well, it, what's trying to be conveyed is, that's right, Jesus has come, Jesus has died, his passion, he's gone into the grave, he's risen, he's ascended, and he's sent the Holy Spirit, and now this is the ordinary way of life. Spirit-filled life, friends, ordinary way of life, spirit-filled, Pentecost-filled reality of the power of God life. That's what we're talking about. But but we need to start living a little bit more like the ordinary that's Jesus's. We live way, way below ordinary, don't we? Okay, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> and since you didn't, I'll answer you. We do. We live, most of us, live way below ordinary in terms of God's expectation of us, but also what we can expect of him. And all these things that are a part of, of, of his life in the power of the Spirit. Pretty soon you begin to see Families changed, people healed, lives changed, people giving up things that are unhealthy, uh, culture being touched, 
All sorts of things begin to happen. It's, it's sad. It's, you're in touch with things eternal. You begin to, to act and move with the Holy Spirit that, that leave eternal marks on life. You know, anything done in the power of the Spirit, anything done to God's, in God's, is, has an effect. It's going to be moved into the new heaven and the new earth. I don't know how that is. I don't know what those things are, but they're going to have effect on the, on the new things. I'm just looking here because I'm already down here and I'm thinking, now how do I get back up there and how do we do all the other stuff of the morning? Gene, am I, if I just come back up here, are you going to present, are you going to have him stand up? Why don't we, why don't you, why don't we close your sermon in prayer and then we'll invite the confirmands and everybody to come forward. That's a great idea. Why don't you lead, don't you lead us in prayer? <laughs> oh, you want me to close it in prayer? Well, you're the bishop. Huh? Smart. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it. Okay. All right. The Lord be with you all. Lord, I pray an anointing on this congregation for the days ahead. I mean, right now, in these days, in this culture, all the issues before them, I ask you to anoint them. Fill them with wisdom. Fill them with revelation. Give new gifts to the Spirit, to their leadership, and to those who are going to be confirmed this morning. Well, Father, we want to be about kingdom-building stuff. And we want to be able to plant churches and heal people and see, uh, well, bring closer the day of your new heaven and new earth. All of these good things, Father, in your name. Amen. Amen.